Hey everybody, welcome back to On the Glad Slope. We are in Ireland, virtual, virtual Ireland today. We're going to try to knock off a couple of viewer request flights to fly in this part of the world. I try to do one of these flights every couple of months. Um, I had one request to fly to Cork, I had another request to fly to Galway. So I'm going to fly to Galway today. And uh, we're doing that over photorealistic scenery that I made with Ortho 4XP. And uh, we're flying with just cirrus clouds, uh, non with just uh, stock weather, because the weather over there is particularly bad right now. And uh, pretty straightforward, uh, heading at 270, we'll track outbound on the um, Dublin VOR, uh, Collinstown it's called. And, uh, but it's about 270 degrees and should be about an hour or so in the air in the Cessna 172 from X-Plane 11. So I'm um, looking forward to seeing the scenery and I'll try to shoot some video out the side windows as we go. I'm also uh, shooting yet another video with the new over the camera or over the shoulder viewpoint. Um, the vast majority of feedback I had was that that was a preferred viewpoint. So I'm happy to do that. And um, we are ready to go. So without any further ado, we will get started. I've updated to the most recent flight model for the Cessna 172. I spent some time tweaking the cockpit layout today so it does what I wanted to do. I'll be interested to see how it flies differently than what we've been using in the past. Let's see, Dublin weather 124.525. I'm ready for that. Dublin information Romeo 1200 Zulu weather. Wind light and variable, visibility more than 10. Sky conditions 20,000 scattered, 35,000 scattered, temperature 14, dew point minus 14, altimeter 2992. Arriving Nine runway nine two. 10, departing runway 2A. Right. On initial we'll go out 28, that's right by where we are. So that's good. And uh, that VOR is 111.2. I've got that coded in already. We're going to fly out on a 270 heading. I've got that coded in to my OBS. We will get our uh, heading bug set to that heading also. And then we'll be ready to go. No ATC over here, so we're not going to be making radio calls. Okay, so if we are where we think, I think we are, and I like to think I am, we're going to go this way. Okay, run up. 2000 RPM. That looks and sounds fine. Magnetos, right. We get a drop, that's good. Okay, that looks good. Gas, center tanks, we have fuel pressure, amperage, vacuum, we're good, fuel flow looks good, everything looks good. Okay, let's go. This is just the default airport for Dublin that comes with X-Plane 11. Looks good, quite realistic. My butt kicker is rumbling. I set it up with just a little crosswind here for takeoff just to make things interesting. That's good, you need right rudder, that felt real. Rotate. That's good. Trim wheel is unresponsive, so I might have to take a break to fix that. But we're off and running. We are going to fly out to on about 
uh, a heading of rough, well, 270 I said, we're gonna fly out at about, oh, probably 4,000 feet, 4,500 feet. Flying right over the VOR. Oh, there's the outer middle marker indicator for the runway. Coming into our needle for our radial. And we are off and running. So this is uh, release candidate one for X-Plane 11, updated today. And um, so far, no problems. Getting about the same frames as I was getting before. Right here I'm probably getting 25 to 30. Uh, that's running with shadows on, second highest on objects. Um, highest textures, I got, I had some requests to post my screenshot, a screenshot of my graphic settings and I'll do that at some point in the near future. Okay, we'll get ourselves trimmed in here. I'm getting more and more used to flying the Saratoga and this feels downright pokey. Here's the M3 down there that we're crossing over. Pretty cool the way that the photorealistic scenery and the ortho, uh, the ortho photorealistic scenery and the mesh combine to make those traffic circles work. And then there's a sense of the textures that come with photorealistic scenery. You can see they look pretty good. Okay, we're settling in for cruise now, so we are going to uh, back off our mixture just a little bit, and our throttle, we'll take our throttle back to about 2400. RPM, and then we'll back off our mixture until the engine runs rough. Come back. Just a little rich of that. Our engine temperature isn't too high. There we go. 100 degrees or so of exhaust gas temperature from peak. Okay. We are just about 4,500 feet and settled in for cruise. Just over Killock. I'm sorry, Kilcock. And generally tracking the M4, we can track the M4 out uh, most of the way. When it merges with the M6, we can then follow the M6 most of the way, at least to the River Shannon, and then we rejoin the M6, and then we can follow it all the way to the airport. In Galway, it runs right by the M6. So with us settled in for cruise here, And again, I never use autopilot. The only time I use autopilot is if I've got something I really have to handle in the airplane and I don't want to hand fly. So I am hand flying this. Um, but uh, this is a flight dedication. We're dedicating this flight actually to the folks and the kids that are part of the aviation STEM class at Hayesville High School in Hayesville, North Carolina. Their uh, teacher, Scott Hanna, sent me a uh, comment on YouTube uh, saying that they had built a simulator for their aviation class that was designed on the same model as this one. Of course, Flight Sim Liberty was the original inspiration for this model uh, in France, so credit where credit is due. 
they said that the site and uh, the YouTube channel had been very helpful to them as they were building it and Scott uh, showed me a couple of videos I was able to see of what they've built and it's a really great looking sim. It's uh, quite similar to this, it's got one set of controls and has an instructor station here where Scott or the other teacher can throw failures and problems at their students and it was just so cool. So, you know, I, my day was already made uh, last week when I was able to solo and it uh, was made again when I heard that news, the fact that this has inspired some kids to not just learn about aviation but actually practice and, uh, you know, work toward being pilots was very, very cool. So this is to the guys uh, at Scott and the team and the kids out in Hayesville. And uh, I know you're competing in the Fly to Learn program and I hope you win. I hope the sim helps you win. And if you don't win, then I know that you've got a great simulator there and that you're all going to uh, have a lot of fun with it and learn a lot from it. And uh, I've got some surprises coming for you as well, so stay tuned because uh, I think uh, I've got some other things I can do to help you get the most out of your experience down there. And uh, they are the Yellow Jackets, if I remember, the Hayesville Yellow Jackets. So here's to the Hayesville Yellow Jackets in the mountains of North Carolina and to your simulation uh, experience and to the training that you're doing and what you're learning about aviation as part of your high school experience. I think that is just fantastic. So thumbs up to you guys. Well, we've got some time here. Let's talk about, because uh, we've got 40 minutes to destination, let's talk about Pilot Edge. I've had quite a few people uh, either in comments or on the blog or in the forums ask about Pilot Edge. So what is Pilot Edge? Pilot Edge is a real world simulation of air traffic control for flight simulators. There are a number of different people who use it. Uh, one group of people who uses it is flight schools who use it to give radio skills training and in particular instrument skills training to student pilots. Uh, another group of people who uses it are real world pilots who either want to uh, just stay fresh on their radio skills or perhaps they're preparing for their instrument training and they want to um, brush up on their procedures and their radio work. And then the third group is flight simulation folks like me, although I use it very much as a student pilot. But guys who just, uh, or girls, who have just enjoyed flight simulation and maybe they've tried VATSIM and uh, they wanted something that was more realistic. Now, when I say that, I don't mean to insult VATSIM. I think VATSIM is a great service. Um, but I think the difference between VATSIM and Pilot Edge is pretty significant. First of all, your guaranteed service on Pilot Edge during the coverage hours. It's 15 hours a day, seven days a week, almost 365 days a year. You don't have to wonder if there's going to be somebody who's working a particular area. It's entirely predictable and dependable. You know that there will be controllers on duty. You know what they are working. Second, uh, the, the level of realism expected of you as a pilot, simulated or real, is very high, and I would say it's real world. The reason why I would say it's real world is because I fly in the real world and what I hear on Pilot Edge is every bit as accurate as what I hear in my student pilot work. And I know more than one real world pilot who says that what they do on Pilot Edge is so great for them because they can count on it to be completely by the book. So ground operations, airspace, IFR procedures, uh, you are expected to know it all. Now you're not expected to know it all before you start, it is a training network. So one of the great things that's about it, one of the great things about it is that you can step into it not knowing much and go from there. I actually started a flying on Pilot Edge before I started my real world flight training. I would even go so far as to say that Pilot Edge was instrumental in me deciding to try real world flight training. I'd been toying with the idea of flight training since I was a kid. I almost did it eight or nine years ago, but decided not to. And one of the reasons why was, as I studied it, I just wanted to make sure that I could be as safe as I could possibly be. I have a busy schedule, uh, you know, I didn't know if I'd be able to have lessons often enough, I didn't know if I'd be able to um, uh, practice often enough. Uh, that's Edenberry off to the left. And we've got a quarry coming up here on the right. 
Uh, and so there was this sense for me in thinking about real flight, real world flight training of, well, could I really do it? Could I really commit to it? And my first flight on Pilot Edge was the test flight, the initial first flight that they asked everybody to do, which then was just a untowered flight from Oceana Airport to San Luis Obispo. And, uh, you know, in all candor, my hands were shaking before I keyed the mic for the first time. Now, if you know nothing about airspace or radio work, and if you're a simmer and you want to learn that stuff, and I found, I found it very gratifying to learn that stuff, um, Pilot Edge gives you all kinds of resources to help you do so. So not only do they recommend a first flight, but they have tutorials for the first flight. They have video tutorials for the first flight. There's an instruction page for the first flight that tells you basically the basics of what you have to know. They also have a VFR training series that teaches you all about VFR navigation, how to use charts, um, how to deal with airspace, the basics of the radio work, because, because again, if you are flying in the sim, they expect you to be following real-world procedures that you are actually using some form of chart that you know where you are and what you're doing and what's expected of you. And so even though I had no real-world flight experience, other than a couple of hours in a Piper Cup as a kid, uh, I was able to read the tutorial, to watch the video tutorial, and load in the sim and fly that first flight on Pilot Edge. And it was great. Uh, again, I was really scared. I was very nervous. My hand, you know, hands were shaking before I keyed the mic. Um, but what I learned was is that uh, you know, it's a, it's a learning network. Now, I f did great my first flight, landed, um, but then I taxied off the runway and I you know, thought I heard a call to taxi to the ramp, but wasn't quite sure. I taxied to the ramp and the controller very clearly said, what are you doing? And I said, I thought I missed a call, I'm not sure, and he said, you don't go anyplace until I tell you to go anyplace. When you leave the runway, and then you have called, you call tower, and then you do what they tell you to do, and if they haven't told you to do anything yet, you don't do anything yet. Well, I didn't know that, and so I learned that. And the Pilot Edge controllers are really good at coaching and teaching you. They are very aware of the fact that they might be dealing with a guy who has 5,000 hours, or they might be dealing with a guy who has none. And so I think they do a great job of accommodating sort of the learning curve of their students uh, and their users to help you learn as you go. Um, can they be busy and impatient? Sure, just like real world air traffic controllers. Um, but will they ever uh, intentionally be rude to you? Nope. Um, they may say to you, look, you're not ready for this yet. You've failed this procedure three consecutive times. You need to go do the training program and then come back. Uh, but. Uh, that first flight is relatively timid or tepid water. It's easy to jump into. You can do it. You can get a flavor for it. And what I got a flavor for when I did it was how serious this stuff really is. That, you know, there are rules to follow and there are safe and unsafe ways to do this. And that actually didn't intimidate me from flying. It actually gave me the confidence to try. So I'm not exaggerating when I say that Pilot Edge had a lot to do with me making the decision to pursue my real world flight training. And, uh, and that's because it gave me a sense of the gravity and the seriousness that's involved in really doing things by the book. Now, if I never decided to do real-world flight training, the fact of the matter is, is that uh, I would still be on Pilot Edge because it's a hell of a lot of fun. And, uh, and you learn so much. So not only is there the initial video series on VFR navigation, they have a series of CAT ratings, which are basically um, you know, airspace training programs that for VFR flyers takes you from a very basic first flight flying from one non-towered airport to another non-towered airport to something a little more complicated flying from a non-towered airport to a towered airport and then flying from a towered airport to a towered airport and then flying from a towered airport to a class Charlie or Delta airspace and then from a Delta airspace to until pretty soon by the last cat rating you are transitioning the Los Angeles Bravo several times and each step along the way, there's training and videos and programs to help you learn what you need to learn to be able to do that successfully. So just as a simulator, as a simulation enthusiast, what I know about airspace and what I know about navigation and how to plan flights has been hugely informed by the free services, in essence, that are provided by Pilot Edge to help people use that service. And now that I've qualified or done most of that, uh, now I'm working on the instrument stuff. So there's a whole set of instrument ratings on Pilot Edge, 11 of them that start with something as basic of the equivalent of instrument pattern work, you know, flying the ILS-20 right approach into John Wayne Airport to ultimately flying 
you know, DME, <laughs> you know, DME uh, arc routes and all kinds of complicated stuff, missed procedures and holds and all the rest. And all of which are things that you can learn and become a better um, pilot, real or simulated, for knowing it. Student pilot, for sure. So I've done the CAT ratings in the old program. I've done some of them in the new program. They recently went from having three training flights in visual navigation and radio skills and airspace up to having seven or eight or nine, nine or ten of them. There are 11 ratings for instrument. I've gone through the first two or three. And I'm going to continue going through those. And it has really helped my real world training a lot because I know what to do on the radios nine times out of ten. And I'm not scared to talk to controllers. Um, the, the great thing about Pilot Edge is the people who are controllers are good enough that they could probably do it in the real world. And occasionally they have people on who have done it in the real world. And so you're not getting somebody who's a hobbyist and learning about air traffic control. Uh, you're getting somebody who has had more than a thousand hours doing it, has gone through their training program, uh, real or simulated time, and they are, you know, doing things by the book. So, you know, my advice to anybody who really wants air traffic control service and whether on X-Plane or Prepared or FSX, and the great thing about Pilot Edge is that you can fly in all three, uh, is to give it a try. There's a 14-day free trial. Keith Smith and the people at Pilot Edge have given me or paid me nothing uh, to say this. This is completely voluntary, um, but it's absolutely worth the 14-day trial. And in that 14-day trial, you can try out some of the CAT ratings and you can play with the network and You'll probably make a few mistakes, and you'll certainly learn a lot, and hopefully you come to like it as much as I do. Um, the other two other, one or two other things that I think I've found with it that are great is, first of all, the coverage area is excellent. There are two coverage areas on Pilot Edge. The first is the entire Los Angeles uh, air traffic control space. Basically, Kanab, Utah, down to the Mexican border, a little bit west of Phoenix. Um, over to San Diego and up to just past Santa Barbara. And that airspace, they have somebody, usually one, two to three controllers working all the time, who are towering or manning every, every towered airport that would be towered in the real world. So every Delta, uh, Charlie, and Bravo airport in the Los Angeles air traffic control space, of which there are dozens, uh, you could load your SIM up on the ramp, dial up ground, uh, ask to taxi and have a person answer you and tell you what you're supposed to do. They often will be managing more than one station. That happens in the real world also. So you may talk to somebody on ground who then is also who you talk to on tower. And then as they are more busy, they add more controllers. I've had flights where I've talked to three or four different people. Um, there's a second part of Pilot Edge, which is newer, which is the Western U.S. expansion, which is the entire airspace for um, basically Kansas westward, uh, and every Bravo in that airspace is towered continually, so Denver, uh, Phoenix, uh, Salt Lake City, um, Seattle, several others, uh, San Francisco, uh, Oakland, uh, there are several other airports that are towered as well, Aspen, a few others, and then they have a rotating bonus field, right now it's Spokane International. And you can fly between those uh, airports anytime, 15, 15 hours a day, and get full service. So it, it really is a remarkable part of the world. Is it, it doesn't have Europe, doesn't have other continents, of course. Um, but you know that's a huge amount of airspace. And if you like to fly tube liners, you can fly legs of several, you know, 1,000, 1,500 miles in that airspace. And if you like to do GNA uh, or GA, you can fly between lots of different places as well. And then, of course, you can fly to any other airport. So I will often, because I like to fly around the western U.S. in the simulator, take off from an untowered airport and fly a leg and land at Salt Lake or Denver or Aspen or something like that and pick up at flight following and then have proper tower vectors and the rest going in uh, along the way. So, uh, you know, there's an extra charge to have the western U.S. expansion. I found it to be completely worth it. Um, the, uh, the other thing that's great about Pilot Edge is Keith and his team have gone to a lot of work to create drone traffic. So you turn off, uh, in Los Angeles airspace, you turn off your internal air traffic control and you turn off your internal uh, AI air traffic, and Pilot Edge fills the airspace with airplanes. Um, there are times flying around Los Angeles where you have to try not to hit people all the time. 
And so that's great because air traffic control is giving you vectors and the rest. Western US, they don't have drones yet, but they'll be recording drone flights and so it'll start to fill up the airspace as well. So there only may be 10 or 15 or 20 people on the network at any given time, but certainly in Los Angeles airspace, you will have plenty of air traffic to handle and deal with. And then in addition, you'll have other real world people who are people you have to you know, deal with or maintain visual separation with or whatever it might be. Um, so that's my, uh, <laughs> that's my uh, recommendation on Pilot Edge. I've also found one final use for it that I really like, which is it's great for multiplayer. I mean, in essence, it's a multiplayer server, and you can load up any place you want and fly multiplayer with other people on Pilot Edge, uh, including when the services, the air traffic control service is closed. So more than once, there's been a group of us who have gotten together to practice procedures or pattern work or something else, and we have uh, managed to do that by loading into an airport, um, flying together, you can see each other, you can hear each other. If you are all switched onto the same frequency, you talk to each other. If you switch off the same frequency, you don't talk to each other. Uh, and we've done that, and then as we've gotten closer to uh, their opening of their service hours, which open at 8 o'clock Pacific AM every day and 11 o'clock Eastern, we have uh, then flown into a towered airport and been sequenced in for landing and landed. So I obviously can't speak highly enough. Um, <clears throat> the one thing that I think keeps people, two things that I keep people from trying it is the cost, uh, because I think it's $20 a month and a bit more for the Western U.S. expansion. Uh, and I just set, set mine up on repeat months ago, so I, I don't candidly remember, but I think that's what it is, 20, 25, something like that, and which I think is worth every penny. And the second is uh, intimidation, at being afraid to try it. And I, I think just go for it. Uh, they have a way for you to listen to recordings. You can listen to live air traffic control service. They've got a little plug-in that you can download for Mac or PC. You can hear the service. They record everything. So you can listen to the last several hours or yesterday's or last month's recordings at any given time. Gives you a sense of how, it ha how, how things work. Uh, you can start the trial and just load in at an airport and just listen and hear how things are going. Um, and then try the first flight. And then once you've got the first flight, I think you'll have the bug and then you can go from there. But uh, for me, I obviously like it because I've spent 10 minutes talking about it. Uh, but it's there's absolutely not, no reason not to give it a shot. If you try it and you don't like it, you, you, you don't... Don't sign up after the 14 days are up and you're done. Um, but I think you'll find that it can add an immeasurable amount to your simulation work and make you a more informed and more realistic um, enthusiast uh, at almost every step of the process. Okay, my um, homily <laughs> for Pilot Edge aside, we are approaching the River Shannon. We've got a little haze today. Um, that's good. That, I think, is realistic. It's often humid in Ireland. Uh, usually we'd have a lot of clouds and today there's rain. But we're coming up to Loch Ree up here on the right and uh, the River Shannon right in front of us. We've got about 20 minutes to go to finish our flight into Galway. And when we come up here by the River Shannon I'll shoot a little video of it and the town of uh, Athlone or Athlone uh, to the, to, off to the right. Okay, we are coming up to the River Shannon here. Coming out of Loch Ree. That's the lock behind us, or behind uh, the strut there. That is uh, the town. And there's the river. It's great. So my initial reports on uh, release candidate one for X-Plane are that it's very solid, very smooth. I don't think I've seen a stutter, stutter since I started. And uh, the default Cessna is flying very well. It's very happy with its performance on the ground. It had been a nightmare to handle on the tarmac. And that's all going fine. All right, we're coming up here. We're going to rejoin the M6. Um, I can see it coming out of our right here and then heading off in front of us. And then it sort of wanders its way. But we track it pretty much along the way from here to Galway. So if we lost radios and we were Nordo and 
had to do something to get there. Uh, the M6 is how we would get there. There goes the River Shannon off to our left now. Okay, we are over Belinislow, and we are about 25, 27 miles out. We're still tracking our VOR radial. I think we still have it. Yep. And now we got to start thinking about Galway. Galway does not have ATIS published. And the METAR would be irrelevant because I'm running custom weather. But we should be thinking pattern altitude, and the pattern altitude is 1,000 feet. We are at 4,500, give or take. So we need to lose 3,500 feet at 500 feet a minute. That would take us uh, seven minutes. We're going about 120 knots, so seven minutes at 120 knots is 14 miles. So 14 miles out is uh, going to be right about when we cross. I'm trying to look for a visual reference. Right about when we cross Woodland Lawns, Woodland Woods, and uh, Woodlawn Woods, and the r river that crosses there. So I'll keep a mental note on that on the chart. Uh, that is only nine miles out, so that's about four and a half minutes out. So another thing I could do is I could just start a stopwatch, and that's what I'll do. Four and a half minutes, we'll start our descent. Runways at Galway are 26 and 08. Same weather, we'll be landing 26. So we'll be wanting to enter on the 45 for our left downwind into that. I won't make straight in because that's not the safest way to enter a pattern. Okay, four and a half minutes. Start a 500 foot per minute descent just by taking the throttle down to 2,000 or so and keeping the airplane trimmed for 100 knots, which is 100 knots or so, which is where we were, 110. It'll stabilize. I can have a little more power to keep that rate of descent where I want it to be. There we go. When you trim an airplane, it wants to stay going at that speed. So when you adjust power, it will pitch itself to keep going about as fast as you were going. So one of the things they teach you in your flight training is that you use power for altitude and pitch for speed. So if I want to descend, I actually didn't pitch down really a whole lot. I just reduced power. The airplane pitched down on itself to keep the airspeed that it had been flying, which is 110 knots. And now I'm flying 110 knots with a 500 feet per minute descent. OK, back on our heading. Athenry is in front of us. It's a town right there. And now I can see the ocean in the distance. Okay. We're over Athenry. I'm going to start looking for the airport. I think I see it right up here. Turn our landing lights on so we're visible. I turn these off so I can shoot video. We'll turn our internal cabin lights back on. Yep, I think I see the PAPI indicators for the airport. I think it's right there. So uh, we will set our heading bug to the runway heading, which is 2826. And we'll get ready to 
make our uh, 45 degree entry into it. Got to fly past the airport to enter on the downwind on a 45. Airspeed's good, everything's green. Coming down to pattern altitude. All right, I like this. Make our turn. Got the town down there in front of us, that looks nice. The European objects look great. down to 1,100 feet. And we're looking for the field. All right, there's pattern altitude. Reflections off the water, off to our right. Where's the airport? I lost the airport. I must have turned past it. Oh, where is it? Hmm. Oh, it's right here. All right, I turned past it. Okay. So, I lost visual on the airport. That could happen in the real world. Unfamiliar airport, you're not quite sure what it looks like. Good thing is we never got into the pattern. So we'll go around here and make that entry one more time. We're not above our mistakes here in, in, uh, on the glide slope, especially when there are mistakes that happen in the real world. Two things that I've learned uh, that have happened to me both, not seriously, but one is I've been in a situation where I couldn't see the airport even though it's you know right in front of you, and that's because they look like big patches of open space. They don't look like airports. And that second is that uh, I've flown over airports and wondered if it was the airport I expected to be at and seeing. And uh, that can happen, and that happens in the real world. In fact, somebody at my local strip, somebody, some pilots of a Falcon jet, which is far too powerful to land at our field, which is only a couple thousand feet runway, was absolutely certain it was Chester County, and they landed at it thinking it was Chester County, and they got down and got out of the airplane and realized they weren't at Chester County. And the problem with that was that airplane is hard to get off a short strip. <laughs> And they eventually got it out of there, but, uh, you know, seasoned pilots with thousands of years of experience flying into the wrong runway, wrong airport, because they expect to see one thing and you force reality to match what you think you're going to see. I know where the airport is now, so I'm not going to make the same mistake again. It's right there. Okay. Coming in on the 45. Losing our altitude. Trim the airplane a little bit. A little below pattern altitude. Back up to it, some power. There we go, that's better. There's the airport. Uh, halfway up the strut, which is right where we want it to be. Okay, we are at our touchdown point. So we will drop our throttle, get into the white arc, fuel pump on, 
Landing light is on. Find about 1700 RPMs is right. Get into the white arc. First notch flaps. Okay, turn our base. My feet got stuck on the pedals. Got some power lines here to fly over. Take a look. Next notch of flaps. Trim the airplane. Start our turn on to final. Keep our speed good here. Now I've noticed this Cessna now sinks like a t rock when the final flaps go in, so I'm not going to give it final flaps unless I absolutely need to. We are, we've got one red, we're just a little high, but that's okay. We'll give final flaps just as we come over the trees. Got our aiming point. There we go, right on the glide slope. Little flaps. Air speed looks good, right about 65 knots. we go. All right. Welcome to Galway. It's nice. This airport has grass. It's nice. Okay, whoever did this, I'll have to look it up and post it in the comments if I remember. Did a good job. All right, let's clean her up. Flaps up. We'll pump off, strobe off, landing light off, Get our trim back to neutral. I presume we've given per permit, we've been given permission to taxi. And we'll park right over here by the main terminal. It's the local FedEx bird. Cool. Nice airport. Guy fueling that FedEx bird over there, that's cool. Why don't we go right up front? Presume that we've got a VIP we gotta drop off right over here. Throttle, magnetos, avionics. Okay, so that's the flight, viewer request flight from uh, Dublin to Galway. Hope you liked it. I had fun doing it. And uh, camera angle, hope that's working out okay. I can't see if the camera's always running, so I keep looking back. <laughs> Uh, and again, viewer request flights, I do them once in a while, kind of when I either have an area where I really want to check out or where there might be a few requests that come in for the same place. So I uh, hope you appreciate and understand that. And uh, thanks again for watching, and uh, I'll see you on the next... Oh, if you want to learn more about the sim, go to the website, www.ontheglideslope.net. All your questions about projectors, setup, software, configuration, almost everything that I get asked in the comments, I answer there. Um, if there's a question that isn't answered, let me know. And uh, other than that, thanks for watching on the Glide Slope. We'll see you on the next uh, video. Thanks.